every time I conduct Bach, I think, ah, oh, this piece is a miracle, because they all are. But this is really something very special. Um, he wrote it as a, a paradigm, a model of, of good part writing, of good counterpoint, to show the musicians in the church how this would be. But he also wrote it to give, make sure that his boys had good theology. So there's something of the didactic, um, theological point of view. very strong and it, it can be very dramatic. I, like, I hope we will make it very dramatic and very communicative so that the, the point of the theology is made, is made very clearly. And it has the drama of, uh, of the St. John Passion, of the St. Matthew Passion as well, the choruses in the St. Matthew Passion. So condensed into this little sort of 20 something minutes, you have a whole world. Almeida Prado is, is one of the most interesting voices in Brazilian music. He had a very distinctive uh, sound world and aesthetic world. We recorded earlier this year this uh, Sinfonia dos Orixás, which will be released with, with this piece, in fact. This piece is very different from the, the, the Sinfonia dos Orixás. It's not, uh, it doesn't have a sort of indigenous flavor to it. It's very sparse. I mean, I, when I first looked at it, you have, you see, Prada's voice, you hear Prada's voice immediately, but it reminds me a little bit of Webern. The whole orchestra virtually never plays together. There are a lot of silences, a lot of pauses. He uses the choir very sparingly. They don't, they don't play, they don't, they're involved in every movement. For me, the challenge of this piece is the control that it needs, because you have long sustained passages of pianissimo from the choir without really, with, with nuance. And to keep the, this very uh, muted atmosphere, but with the text intense. So I think that's something we're going to, 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 to be working at. Está mais feliz né, de tocar nessa ocasião, encontrar tantos colegas que eu já conheço aqui da, da orquestra, é, fazer música com, com o maestro Neil Thompson, que é um grande maestro, um músico enfim, que eu admiro muito, é, com a OZESP na Sala São Paulo, então com certeza é uma realização de um sonho, estou assim. muito feliz. Vaughan Williams is, for me, one of the most important British composers. Um, and that might seem an obvious thing to say, but I think he's important for the reasons that people don't give him credit for. Vaughan Williams has been subsumed 
into the sort of easy listening classic FM composer, the loved, beloved British figure. We love national treasures, and, and you know, Vaughan Williams is a national treasure. But what he was, in reality, was a radical, a radical visionary who changed the shape of British music. Um, if you think of it, one of his pieces, the, the, the Thomas Tallis Fantasia, which is yet again a beloved classic now. But when it was first performed, it, it shocked people profoundly because before that piece, nothing sounded like this in British music, in music. For me, whilst of course the, the, the Lark Ascending is, is more typical of Vaughan Williams' pastoral style, I think his position as a composer, as a, as a radical visionary, is important to remember. Essa peça é muito especial, ela é muito meditativa, né? Eu acho que ela é, tem um. A música em geral, né? A música, acho que tem o um poder da gente ser transportado para uma outra atmosfera. E essa música em especial, ela realmente ela é muito reflexiva, é, muito descritiva, né? É, a gente consegue imaginar justamente o que o, o compositor, o Vogue Williams, ele queria, né? Ele se inspirou em um poema chamado Lark Ascend, né? Que fala da ascensão da cotovia, né? E que a cotovia, ela, ela voa, ela tem um, é um voo muito característico, né? Ela voa muito rápido para o alto e é um voo muito ondulante, então ele começa é, a peça dois compassos na né, orquestra com um pianíssimo e de repente do, do, do grave, não é tão grave, mas enfim, ele sai do ponto de partida e ele fica oscilando para o agudo, para o médio, de repente vai mais para o agudo e no decorrer todo da peça tem temas folclóricos, né? É, ingleses e no final mesmo que é o como se fosse o voo dela que acaba super agudo no violino Acho que essas mudanças de timbres, de cores, né, de mudanças de, de atmosfera mesmo que ele põe na, na peça, eu acho que isso é uma das dificuldades. Assim. Ele coloca o tema é, ele, repetidamente, né, só que em ritmos diferentes. Então, também, para memorizar isso, não é muito é, fácil, digamos assim. Né? Mas eu acho que o que ajuda também muito na memorização dessa peça é justamente tentar imaginar a expansão né, do... do da cotovia, porque cada vez vai mais para agudo e ele põe figuras rítmicas diferentes, mais rápido, então eu acho que tudo isso ajuda muito. Então acho que é muito descritivo e eu acho que é uma realmente uma experiência sensorial, assim, de você poder ouvir, é, fechar o olho e se permitir se transportar, né? E eu acho que é, e, é, e especialmente nesse momento acho que a gente precisa, né, dessa paz que a música tem o poder de proporcionar para a gente. Então, é, estou muito feliz. I can't claim to know every note of Villalobos' music. He wrote a lot of music, but I think that out of the pieces I know, the symphonies and, and, and the concerti, this is his masterpiece. I think it's a work of of genius. And that's, I know it's a word that's often used, but it's a work of genius, of, of a, an imagination so profound and different. Um, 
I mean, it was written in 1925, and it's still quite shocking. Um, a really dazzling modernist masterpiece, which uses elements of Brazilian rhythms. There's some, some colors which you could say are, are very Brazilian, but presented in a way that is, it, they said it was like, you know, the Le Fauve, that, that French school of painting. This is his most fauviste piece. It's very strong with superimposition of, of different rhythmic layers, a structure which is, free but makes sense at the same time. It's, it leaves people quite shocked. I mean, a friend of mine told me there was a Villa Lobos weekend in London about 10 years ago with the BBC Symphony Orchestra with this. And Choros 10, everyone loved, and Bacchianus 9, everyone loved. And I listened to the recording of this, and at the end of it, there's a stunned silence in the hall for about five or six seconds, which seems, and then people started clapping. But it leaves you a little bit like this at the end of it. And I'm, I, I'm sure we, we, will, we will have the same effort. We had a very good first rehearsal this morning, two excellent pianists. So I think it's, good. it's going to be a great concert. <laughs>